might imagine, I have spent considerable time in prayer this week, thinking about what would be a helpful word for our community. And in God's sovereignty, I actually think it's amazing that we find ourselves where we do in our series in Acts, at the natural conclusion of the first act of this portion of the book of Acts. You will be my witness in Jerusalem, is where we find ourselves. You know, Luke tells us that the church has grown that people have heard the good news of the gospel and they have come to believe. Things in the early church, by all accounts, are going pretty well. And then Luke tells us that the church is hit with the very real complexity of people, of people's needs. Because people, us, are messy and human. And we have physical needs that bid our attention. And so why don't we read together from this passage in Acts chapter 6, starting at verse 1. I'm going to give you time because I know you have your Bibles with you. Beautiful. Acts chapter 6, starting at verse 1, reading from the NLT. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. And then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea. And they chose the following, Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. What is happening in this text? Well, the church has grown rapidly, right? There's been an expansion of the early church because daily people are coming to believe the good news that this Jesus is the Messiah, that he is king, that he ushers in a new kingdom. And because of that, there are varying needs that are starting to become apparent in the early church because different people are joining into their group of people. They come from different backgrounds. They have different languages. They have different social standings. And so like any organization that has grown, new opportunity and need are identified. New opportunity and need are identified. And naturally, it represents a need for more leadership, for a shared load across their community. I don't think that we are supposed to read this section, this portion of scripture, and take this as a menial issue that doesn't you know, really need to be an issue in the early church. I think that we're supposed to understand that this is a real problem. 
This is a real problem confronting this church, an outcome of a group of people that are cross-cultural in their very nature. The Jewish people, the Jewish church, they have always cared about widows. They have always taken the call to care for widows seriously as a part of their long, long, long faith tradition. Jesus cared about widows. Jesus named them in his stories. And Jesus also cared about daily needs. And he invited the church to pray for their daily needs. Daily bread prayers. As I read these verses, I find myself drawn to imagine the scenario, to think about what this might have looked like and sounded like and and how these conversations in this group of varied people perhaps went down. I wonder if the church leaders were tempted by the identification of something broken in their community, whether they were tempted to change their mission Were they discouraged, frustrated? Were they tempted perhaps to pause, put a brakes, put the brakes on everything that had been happening in their community, on the call to go out into the world with the message of the good news of the kingdom? Were they tempted to change direction or to slow down on the mission that they had been given? But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power and will tell people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It causes me to consider how I might be tempted to respond when I am overwhelmed by the need of our human experience. I've become convinced this week that there is great wisdom for us in this Acts 6 story for our community. In these few short verses, we see a church who ministers to the need, embraces the call to participate, and stays on mission to spread the good news of the kingdom of heaven. And we, we cannot diminish or minimize our human experience. In these verses, we see that people are hungry, right? Widows are hungry. They have a very real need. And the apostles, they don't respond to the Greeks' complaints by ignoring them. They don't diminish or cast aside their hunger. I wonder if it's because they've seen Jesus attend to very real physical need. They've seen the practical way that Jesus turned up for people in their moment of need, feeding the thousands. He addressed the crowd's physical need in order that he might then address their spiritual need to minister to their need. Jesus, when confronted by the death of his friend Lazarus, And the deep disappointment and grief of Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, he doesn't respond with, well, come on, let's just get on with it. I'm going to fix all of this anyway. John 11 tells us, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother, he would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. 
Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. And then Jesus wept. And the people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. You know, the word tells us that Jesus, he sees the human experience and feeling it himself, he weeps. And I know that we all come this morning before Jesus with our own needs. Maybe some of us this morning, like Mary, are crumpled at the feet of Jesus. As a community of people, each of us carries our own experience of of trauma and pain, which require fresh healing balm from the healer today. Some of us are keenly aware of our broken nature and the impact that it might have on those around us. Some of us have sickness and disease that we carry in our bodies today. Maybe we're experiencing financial difficulty. Maybe we're wrestling with relational rupture. Maybe we feel worried or anxious about our future. Our needs, like the early church's needs, are real. And what we see modelled both in Jesus' response and in the apostles' response in Acts 6 is not an ignorant denial of human need, but instead a deliberate and intentional call to action. A reiteration that the gospel is an invitation to participation as we bear one another's needs, the gospel is expanded. That I think is profound. As we bear one another's needs, the gospel is expanded. As I've considered the apostles' response in chapter 6, a situation which honestly could have undone the early church, backfighting and misunderstanding and unmet need, both perceived and also real, I have been reminded that the ability of the early church to respond to their human experience in a way that both ministers to need, invites participation and continues to spread the good news comes from their capacity to remain in him. And so God's message continued to spread. The numbers of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the the Jewish priests were converted too. They choose to remain in him. Fixing their attention on Jesus, the early church responded to their circumstances and their situations not governed by anxiety or confusion, but governed by their mission to tell others the good news that in our brokenness, in our suffering, in our human experience, Jesus is the answer. He is the King And he will reign into eternity, not just now in this moment, but forever. That restoration to God and to each other has been made possible in Christ Jesus. You know, our theme all year, our our kind of our guiding vision has been the word abide, right? It's been up on our screen all year, abide. Because we know that when we are separated from the vine, we are easily shaken. When we are separated from the vine, our need overwhelms us and it shadows our view of Jesus and it shapes our response. 
in order to live out the gospel, we have to have roots that are deeply anchored in Christ. We are called to remain in his love and to love each other as is expressed here in Acts chapter 6. And so I want to invite you to turn with me to John 15 and to read these verses together this morning. John 15, if you're new to the Bible, it's back that way from Acts. (laughs) I am the true grapevine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and they wither. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. And if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment, love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. You are now my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. pretty clear. We remain in him by obeying his commandment. And what is his commandment? I reckon we could do that better. (laughs) The response of the early church is minister to need, participate as a community, and continue to spread the good news. That all sounds to me a lot like love one another. I I abide in him by fixing my attention on Jesus, on what he has done, on who he is, on the way that he has called me to live out my life of faith in him by loving those around me. And so then, what can you contribute to the body? 
How, how might you love one another in order that we collectively remain in him, that our attention remains fixed on Jesus, that we're not overwhelmed by our need, acknowledging it, but remaining in his love? Well, I think that this passage is a pretty great place for us to start. What is the felt need in the community? What is the felt need? In Jerusalem, the need was food and caring for the widows. That might not be the need here at Enfield Baptist Church, although I think if you know me, you know I am a pretty big fan of food around a table in community together, so maybe it is the felt need. But perhaps the felt need is just you committing to call someone every day to pray with them. Someone who is struggling or not struggling. Perhaps it's to open your home and just to commit to inviting a single person or a lonely person or a struggling family into the mess of your day-to-day -day life. Maybe it's just to show up and to keep on showing up because we cannot underestimate how much we need each other in times of trial and how much seeing familiar faces buoys our spirit. Being in community, it matters. Perhaps it's a financial need. Perhaps there is somebody that you can help to ease the financial burden for. Perhaps God has been stirring you to consider how you might help to lead a small group. Maybe you can join the New Beginnings team and reach out to our community by making coffee or just being present and attentive to the needs of the people in our area. Maybe the need is for you to read the word of God with another person. Commit to reading the word of God together to deepen your faith in him, that you might abide, remain in him. What is the felt need today? How might we remain in him by loving one another? Can you imagine how the community watching that early church might have responded when they saw a cobbled group of people, Jewish, Greek, slave, free, male, female, rich, poor, well, unwell, a cobbled group of believers who were prepared to participate in a way that ministered to need and worked with unity. We don't have to imagine that, actually, if we keep reading. <laughs> Because the Bible tells us what happened. And so God's number, God's message continued to spread. Nope. Fine. God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted to Could our commitment to each other our willingness to participate and our steadfast desire to remain in Jesus astonish those around us in a way that they come to believe in the hope that we have found in Christ Jesus. That is my deepest prayer for us. That is my deepest prayer for you that we would remain in him. Let's pray. King Jesus, you are constant. You are consistent. You are unchanging. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
and you have called us friend. You have invited us into community with God the Father, with King Jesus and with the Spirit. Would we be reminded this morning that we have been invited to remain in you? Help us to see the felt need in order that we might participate in the expansion of the good news of the kingdom of heaven. We thank you for the gift of your son on the cross for us. We thank you that you have made a way for restoration for us, for the person next to us, and for the people in our community. This morning, Jesus, would you help us to fix our attention on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. In your mighty name.